Um, I'm going to do this in English. I hope you don't mind. Um, so I'm not just going to speak about critical care today. I'm going to be speaking about the whole of healthcare. And I think um, when I used to practice medicine in the NHS in the UK, I didn't get many chances to look at the system as a whole. And I think I came at it from the other way. I saw some of the impacts of the systemic inefficiencies as a clinician on the front line that made me feel like I was firefighting a lot. Um, and I felt that that left me as a clinician as a very blunt instrument. I was able to do good things for my patients, but I wanted to do more. And so I think understanding the system and understanding what we can do about the system can be very helpful for us on the front line as clinical people. So I'm just going to take, take a step back from everything and just think about healthcare and how it's evolving. So, and we, we're going to talk about this all over the world. So global healthcare needs are evolving. This is something we know. It applies to Mexico. It applies to Latin America. It applies to the US, the UK, China, everywhere. We know that populations are growing. Granted, in Mexico, the population growth is now about 1% per year, but that's still quite significant if you consider the size of the population. We know that populations are aging, so people are living longer. Of course, things like public health have improved. Um, quality of life towards the end of life has not necessarily gotten better, and that's something we're still working on. But we know that people are going to be around for longer, and that's going to continue. This is an important one. So we have this rise in chronic non-communicable diseases. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, obesity, and metabolic disease. Now, when a lot of healthcare systems were designed, they weren't designed to deal with those kind of diseases, things that people have to live with on a day-to-day -day basis for a very long time, and for which people need care at home, at work, and in their community. So that rise, of course, is happening everywhere in the world uh, and is not just limited to advanced economies. And then finally, we have this ongoing lack of access. So by that, I mean there are geographical issues when it comes to access, but there are also economic barriers to access. Um, I know that uh, half the GDP uh, in this country that is spelt, uh, spent on healthcare um, is spent out of pocket in the private sector rather than covered by the government and the public sector. That's one example of it. But I think there are important geographical and economic barriers to access that mean there is something we need to do differently. So for some countries, in particular the advanced economies, that's led to an unsustainable increase in spending. So as is typical, as needs increase, we tend to do more. So these are just a few examples from around the world. So you've got the UK, you've got the US there, France, Germany, and others. The message from these graphs, uh, as you can see, is, is really that the expenditure on healthcare in every country, or in most of these countries in any case, is outstripping GDP growth. So we're spending an increasing amount of money on healthcare, and of course that can't go on forever. When it comes to critical care, we know that these are some of the sickest patients, and of course also some of the most expensive. So that increase in spending is unsustainable. And then for other countries, resources have struggled to keep up with those evolving needs. So whilst those needs have gone up, even though the systems are similar, there haven't been resources to keep up with those increased needs. So in Mexico, if you look at the percentage of GDP spent on healthcare, you know, it's, it's not really gone above 6%. Um, and it's sort of leveled off just below that at about 5.8%. Now, Mexico is an OECD country. The average percentage of GDP spent on healthcare in the OECD countries is about 9%. So it's significantly lower than that. And as I mentioned, quite a big chunk of that is in the private sector, which of course is a problem for access. But that's an issue when you have a, a national health system that's trying to, or has, uh, set itself a target of achieving universal healthcare. So in concept, we have this concept of universal healthcare, but in practice, not necessarily so. So that's why this is important. And then if we look at this across the other OECD countries, as I've said, you can see where that sits. So definitely far towards the bottom. That's not to say that we need to be spending more. What it means is that the way we deal with our resources needs to be very diligent. And I'm going to get to how, for countries that can spend more, 
and for countries that cannot, why that's a problem for both. So this is where it hits us in the face. So if we look at the data that is available, we can see that despite increased spending, even if we do get more money into the budget for healthcare, in the current global healthcare ecosystem, that increased spending is not leading to improved outcomes for patients. So we're not financing healthcare in the right way. There's, there's money going into the system and we're not getting better outcomes on the other end. And this, if you look at the red line here, it's a very crude measure as an outcome, but it's life expectancy. And then the green bars, just like the previous graph, are looking at the percentage of GDP spent across the OECD countries. You can see that there's no real correlation there. There's a disassociation between spending and outcomes. And um, that's a significant problem because as things stand, we're going to continue to put more money into healthcare, but we're not going to improve outcomes on the other end. Where there is data available, we see actually that in addition to not improving outcomes, the outcomes are very, very variable, depending on where you get your care, who your health insurer is, who the practitioner is, which technology is being used, etc. So, you know, we have in countries like the UK and Sweden up to a 20-fold difference in the outcomes for things that are very common, heart attacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the issue here, again, is about how we finance healthcare. There's a, there's a real problem with the way we're spending our money. Now, that's a significant barrier to sustainability in healthcare. It's, it signals to us that as those needs that we discussed earlier continue to increase, that healthcare is actually likely to get worse instead of better. Why is that? Because whether you have the resource, if you have the resources or not, those resources are being constrained in what is a volume-driven system, trying to do more. That means that quality is likely to go down because you're spreading limited resources more thinly as those needs increase. It means that access is either going to go down or stay the same, but with population growth and with people living longer and more people with chronic disease, the access is likely to go down. We cannot provide quality healthcare to more people. And then innovation is, of course, going to go down, and the dissemination of that innovation is going to go down because innovation requires investment. So what we're heading towards, I know this sounds very gloomy, but what we're heading towards in the current system is generic, poor quality, for the select few. As I'm sure you know, the, the problem is not technology. You know, we have brilliant technologies in healthcare and beyond. The problem is in the health system because we have these great technologies, but we can't get them to everyone. Access is a major issue. So I'm gonna go into a bit more detail on that in a moment. If we take a step back and we think about healthcare as a function in society, in a civilization, I think healthcare is unique because we have a unique set of requirements. We need to provide healthcare for everyone at some point in their lives. So everybody at some point is likely to be a patient or a consumer. That healthcare has got to be of high quality because good health is a key enabler of everything else that we do in society, work, family, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got to do that with finite resources because resources are finite. So that, uh, that triangle of requirements is already very difficult. And since the, since the beginning of time, when we've tried to design healthcare, we haven't thought about it like this necessarily. So if we take a step back, we can see that we need to be looking at quality and resources or outcomes and costs when we design healthcare. It's, it's fundamental to what healthcare is for. It's, it's, it's fundamental to what healthcare is required for in a population. We have to be looking at outcomes and costs. So that takes us to the value equation. And to say that the focus of healthcare needs to shift to value. And this concept that, we, that we've been hearing about all over the world, value-based healthcare, we hear about it in the US, we hear about it in Europe, now everywhere. But this is about optimizing outcomes and costs and delivering the best possible outcomes to the patients at the lowest possible cost. It sounds like common sense, it is common sense, but it's not the way healthcare is designed at the moment. And it's the one common goal that unites the interest of all parties in healthcare. So whether you are a provider, a patient, a payer, a supplier, technology, et cetera, et cetera, the, if you don't have that patient lens on outcomes, then you're missing the point. And if you don't have that cost lens, then you're not being realistic because everyone has to deal with finite resources. So this is value-based healthcare. 
I'm going to later on in the presentation just, just tell you briefly where we are globally on this before my colleague Fernando uh, tells you a little bit more about where we are in Mexico and where the opportunities are. But I think at this stage, just understanding the concept, it is that simple in concept when it comes to the practicalities of implementation. It, of course, gets very complicated because healthcare is very complicated. So I've already described um, or, or I've already gone through the definition of value-based healthcare, but over the last 10 years or so, this, this work has really uh, become sort of the top of agenda for healthcare policy in a lot of countries around the world. A lot of initiatives are going on in hospitals, in insurance companies, in tech companies like Medtronic uh, and in others. And um, in the last 10 years, because of some work that was done at Harvard Business School by Professor Michael Porter, published a book uh, and various articles on the topic, Harvard then co-founded this non-profit organization called ICHOM, the Natural Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement, who were really trying to catalyze the concept of value-based healthcare in the real world, and they continue to do that today. But beyond catalyzation, I think the responsibility of making that change sits with the various stakeholders in the healthcare system. So the government, the payers, the providers, tech companies, pharmaceuticals, private and public sector, these are the stakeholders that need to make the change. And, of course, those changes need to be made around that fundamental concept of value because it's the one thing that unites them all. And if we think about how this works just on a very basic level, you know, you, you, you've got to think about starting by tracking and improving real-world outcomes and costs. So from a supplier or a tech perspective, we're not talking about clinical trials. From a provider perspective, we're talking about what actually happens in the clinic with patients. And with costs, we're not talking about prices and claims. We're talking about what is the actual cost of delivering a particular um, technology or a service or something else in a care pathway to a patient. So if you start by tracking and improving those outcomes from a data perspective, then you can streamline that health system around what delivers the best outcomes. You can reduce costs in the health system in that way. So it's, you can call it value-enhancing cost reduction. And that way, you're going to increase value in the health system. So this is both a macro and a micro concept. At the macro level, it's about how stakeholders work together. It filters down to how a hospital sets its strategy, to the way departments work with each other, to the way care pathways are designed, and to how the patient interacts with their doctor or nurse in the clinic. It's all about those outcomes, uh, and on the back end, about how to reduce costs to achieve those outcomes. My second to last slide is about payment. So taking it back to that concept of, at the beginning, which is about how healthcare is paid for. This is all about ultimately how we manage resources to produce high quality healthcare that's accessible for all. So we know that there are many different types of payment models that exist in the healthcare system globally. And one of the ones that we know very well is fee for service. So the more we do the more we get paid in healthcare. And of course, that's a problem because it incentivizes over-intervention, which isn't necessarily always the best for patients. And of course, resources need to be available to over-intervene. And, and then if, if we start to sort of shift away from that, we're talking about paying for performance. So if you start to finance a health system or the stakeholders in a health system based on the outcomes achieved, that changes the paradigm significantly. So the way that's done can of course vary and there are cases in the US for example where it's not being done very well because of a penalty system that encourages various stakeholders to game the system to avoid complicated patients etc which is why this all gets very complicated but if you continue to move along that, that curve you start to see integrated care and bundle payments so that's where a set of services are provided within a fixed cost for an episode of care and then you start to shift towards capitation and global payment and accountable care. So when you have a provider system that is taking care of the holistic needs of a patient across a care pathway, across a care cycle, and trying to do that within a specific cost. And because of the constraint on resources from governments and payers that we're seeing, the risk in all of this is getting shifted away from those who are in charge of the resources, governments and payers, and starting to be shifted towards providers because providers of care have the ability to influence the outcomes far more than the, the people that finance healthcare do. And so this is a change that we're seeing in more advanced health systems. It's a, it, it's a change that 
We've seen earlier in some of the enabling environments for value-based healthcare, like in Europe, like in places like Singapore. But I think the, the healthcare world has seen that this is, this is a need that has to be met. We, we have to find a way to pay for outcomes in healthcare and set the system up as such. I'm just going to very briefly mention um, where, where the world sees itself on value-based healthcare at the moment. So there was a study that was done three years ago by the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, who looked at about 25 countries across the world to look at what the readiness for value-based healthcare is. So aligning on the principle and some of the key enablers for it, just trying to have a look at the health system, look at the payment systems, look at various things, as you can see here. So the policy and institutions, measurement of outcomes and costs in the real world, the, um, the frequency of integrated and patient-focused care, and outcomes-based payment models. So seen as four of the key enablers for value-based healthcare. And I think... Um, Generally, we're still very much at the early stages. Uh, there is a real-world experimentation that's going on in this space right now. Um, it's going to take time. Healthcare is incredibly complicated. Um, but we are starting to see some progress across the world. And so if we think about this new idea adopter curve, so the innovation curve, we're still very much you know, at that first one or two areas where you know, we've got some innovative leaders, particularly in Latin America, where you have those leaders trying to implement this. It's different everywhere. It's different in Latin America to North America. It's different in Mexico to Brazil or Colombia. And each healthcare system at a national level and a regional um, needs to understand what value-based healthcare can look like in reality for them. And that's an encouraging thing, I think, for healthcare systems that are struggling for resources because ultimately the opportunity sits with the ability to avoid that same mistake in, in that we, we try to push a volume-driven system like we have in the US where we spend more and more and more and ultimately end up with the same issue, which is that resources that are put into healthcare are not getting us better outcomes on the other end. So I think it's, it's a really good opportunity for an emerging market health system like the one in Mexico to get this right before some of the advanced economy health systems do so themselves. So I'm going to stop there, and I'll just hand to my colleague, Fernando, who's going to speak a little bit more about the specifics here in Mexico. Thank you.